right, so let's get it started. So we have two speakers today. Uh, if it's your first time, normally we introduce the speaker, we say something about them that may or may not be true, and then uh, we start a talk. So we have a shorter talk, and then Kieran is going to do the longer talk. So Wukash is an operation engineer at Wikia, where he's uh, hard working on saying no. Between no and no, he focuses his work at a modern approach to monitoring and distributed storage. Uh, oh, monitoring and distributed storage. Uh, Lukas also, Lukas also has uh, recently completed a lion taming course online. So let's give it up for him. Okay, uh, hi, I'm Lukas, and uh, I will be talking today about uh, path, path or typos in passwords and uh, the ways how uh, we can securely uh, correct them. So this is a pretty fresh paper uh, from last month, and uh, it's uh, touching really interesting uh, problem when, when people are trying to log in and they are making typos. And uh, what, uh, what are the typos? Uh, so uh, the main talk is, uh, or the, the paper is split it into two parts. Uh, the first part is, uh, is about typos and what are the typos, how people are making typos, what kind of typos. And the other one is about security, like how we can correct them, uh, can we even correct them, uh, and uh, is, it, is it even secure. So, uh, typo. Uh, Wikipedia provides this uh, definition of typo, is when you are trying to type something, you make mistake, and there is a different character, or there's additional character, or there is a missing character, or uh, anything else. It's just wrong string. So, uh, top three typos. Uh, the paper described top three typos as a first one is a caps lock. When you are typing something, there's a caps lock turned on, and uh, it's wrong password, uh, or something else. Uh, the other one is the first letter that is flipped. Uh, it should be lowercase, it's uppercase, or the other way around. And the third one, the most popular, is also adding character at the end. So you are typing something, and at the end there is like additional character. So uh, right now on the market, there is a, at least one company that is already doing that, that's already correcting typos in passwords, and it's a Facebook. Uh, if you try to log in on your Facebook account and you, for example, use your correct password, of course it's working. If you uh, switch all the letters up and down, so all the letters that should be lower are upper and so on, uh, it will also allow you to log in. And uh, if you switch also only the first letter from lower to upper or the other way, it, it's also correct. So uh, it's already working and uh, apparently it's at least for them secure. So uh, authors of this paper, they made an experiment just to understand uh, what are the typos, uh, what typos people are doing. Uh, and to do the experiment, you need to actually collect passwords. Uh, so there are a couple of ways how you can generate those passwords, but you know uh, it's important to understand the real distribution of passwords, like people people using uh, specific passwords. So you can either try to use uh, something that is you know really popular. Uh, the problem with that leak is uh, you got uh, those passwords encrypted, so we need to use additional power to actually crack them and understand what people are using as a password. But a couple of years ago, there was a case where uh, the company called Rockyu. Uh, also was target, uh, and uh, apparently they were not really hashing passwords. Everything was in plain text, and uh, the leak was for 32 million passwords uh, and entire user data. So authors of this paper, they use this database, and they make experiment using uh, Mechanical Turk, uh, which is Amazon service to distribute uh, work. So they, they collect, uh, 100,000 passwords as a sample. They, they make a sample with uh, replacing, uh, replacing. So the distribution of passwords 
in a sample is the same as distribution passwords in an entire database. They choose passwords between six and 25 characters. Uh, all longer passwords were not generated by users. It was some random strings generated probably by some software. And they split those passwords into 180 characters for every test. So every person who was typing those passwords got like between 16 and 22 passwords to retype. And they were basically recording that and checking what kind of typos people would do. So 5.5% of all those unique passwords uh, were uh, mistyped. And the uh, majority of them were uh, mistyped because uh, people were using caps lock, like they were unaware of that. Uh, they also noticed that if you normalize letters in those passwords, uh, in those wrong passwords, or in those wrong uh, mistyped passwords, 86% uh, you can actually uh, treat as correct passwords. So uh, that was the majority. So they thought like, let's understand better how people are making typos. Uh, they designed this, this framework to, to understand that. So basically when you got string called password uh, and the first letter is uppercase, you put at the beginning uh, bracket S. So it's supposed to uh, describe that as a shift and first letter and the rest of the word. Uh, if you got something more complicated, for example, three, three letters uh, are uh, uppercase, then they use bracket C as a so, uh, definition of caps lock, and so on. Uh, adding letters, removing letters. At the end of that, they, uh, they present this uh, histogram of uh, typos based on this experiment. So we, we see a couple of interesting fields over here. Uh, the first one is upper corner, where we see uh, people were typing basically uh, digits in some random way, like on a, on one one uh, we see what should be typed and uh, what was typed, and the color is how often it was that, this kind of mistake. So we see that digits were uh, mistyped all the time. There is a strong uh, line across this entire square. So people were typing the letter just next to the correct one or after the next, uh, after the correct one. There were a couple of typos uh, that was uh, wrongly understand. So in case of instead of L, someone type one or instead of O, someone type zero and so on. Uh, of course, there were a couple of uh, errors connected with uh, shift and caps lock, and see, we see that on a corner. After that, they uh, start measuring like what kind of typos we can get, uh, what, what people were doing, what kind of mistakes they were doing. So they split that into a couple of categories, and. Uh, What is important over here is uh, approximately errors are more common on mobile just because the keyboard is smaller. It's way harder to uh, type. Uh, it's w less possible that you add additional character on mobile, which is interesting because later they will prove that it's on a, it's not really happening that often. And uh, and all the oh switching all letters from upper uh, uppercase to lowercase is less possible with mobile just because uh, mobile keyboard is automatically switching off to normal letters. So after they collect all those information and uh, corrector is also important because they name the most popular one uh, over here that they will use later in in some other metrics. Uh, they made a real experiment. They, uh, they test uh, what kind of typos in passwords people are doing when they are logging to Dropbox. It was not affecting uh, any user. It was not correcting any passwords for users. There were only, whenever user was mistyped his password, they were checking what kind of correction they can make to make this password correct, but 
the user was getting like, it's error, it's not working password, it's not correct. So the test was 24 hours. Uh, they are not releasing information about a uh, number of logins or anything like that. They are just releasing ratio between how many errors was made and uh, how many of those tries they can correct in with one of those correctors. So they used five of them. It's from the previous slide, all those correctors. And the result was as we can see, uh, if we, the, the important one is uh, last character. So with, with mobile, if we uh, remove last character from, from password, it's really uh, often a typo. So uh, we can correct those passwords. So they, they check that for a mobile, for a desktop. Uh, most of those graphs are the same. As a result, uh, Almost 20% of users that mistype their passwords uh, could be logged in. Like with just simple switching letters or removing letters, we can actually authenticate those users. And uh, they also noticed that 3% of uh, users, uh, they will never try to log in again after they get a error or uh, information that the password was incorrect, they will not try again, at least through uh, 24 hours. So the question is, is that even secure? Removing, adding characters, changing based on what users are typing. So uh, there are different types of passwords and uh, both from this picture are really great. The reality is way different. The most popular password right now is one, two, three, four, five, six, and that's like a huge amount of passwords if you grab a huge database of users. So, first of all, uh, those corrections are not affecting security in case of uh, offline attack when the entire database was leaked or uh, someone got access to, uh, to those hashes, it's, it's basically the same. It's still the same hash, it's still the same, you know, strong as, as you crypt it. Uh, it is also important that uh, multiple sites are not really allowing to make a brute force attack through some form uh, login page or any other way. The, the number of tries is limited. So you need to actually know what's the distribution of passwords in a database that you are attacking. And, uh, and it's not trivial to understand that distribution when you don't know what's in database. You can just estimate that. So they propose a couple of checks to ensure how correcting passwords is affecting actually security. Uh, they propose a couple of checks First one is uh, we are also, of course, implementing all those correctors that we were talking uh, earlier. And uh, the first one is we are uh, skipping uh, the most popular passwords. So we are blacklisting them. The other one, we are always uh, checking uh, all the passwords or all the all the correctors, and the other one, we are also adding approximation uh, corrections. So if there was a type at one character, let's see if we can just switch to one on the left or one on the right and see what will be the result. So, so they uh, try to do that with estimating attackers, and uh, what they did over here, they used a couple of databases, uh, leaked databases with passwords, and they check what will be the result if you try to attack, uh, for example, Roku database, knowing exact distribution of passwords in Roku database. So the green one, the green uh, box, is, uh, is, is a result of that, so they try you got 10 tries, you know exact distribution of those passwords, uh, and how lucky you will be. So the chances are near 2% that you will guess the passwords if you know the distribution. Uh, if you apply all those checkers 
you can increase that by 0.25%, so not that much. Uh, if you are, these allow the top 1,000 passwords uh, from, from all those checkers, uh, the chances are getting lower, and uh, approximately a uh, check is not really improving anything. If you increase number of tries, and you got, you are lucky and you use a MySpace database, the chance with, with exact is like almost 10%, but the improvement using all those checkers or all those correctors is uh, up to 3%, and that's it. So, but that's a, that's a, that's a perfect case when you know exact distribution of passwords. It's not happening in the real world. So, they want to understand better uh, what will be the result if you don't know the exact distribution. So, they try to attack, for example, Roku uh, database, uh, Roku database uh, with, uh, with passwords that they collect from, from MySpace, for example, or you know, any of those uh, free databases. Uh, so, in the best case, when you know exact distribution, it's like up to 11% that you will guess. Uh, but if you don't know exact distribution, it's getting lower. And if you implement all those correctors, it's, it's not that high. It's like 28% improvement compared to what was uh, what was the chance knowing exact distribution? Uh, also, there are some cases where your chance to uh, to guess the password if you apply all those correctors are even lower, because uh, if attacker thinks, for example, that you are always it, it doesn't matter if you type password starting with uppercase or lowercase because you treat them the same. He may choose wrong distribution of passwords with wrong assumption or wrong distribution for each of them, and the chance that he will guess the real password is even lower. So uh, it's happening, it's possible. Uh, they, uh, they want to invest that more. So. Uh, Conclusion for that is it's all about user experience. It's, uh, it's a question that everyone needs to answer, like what is more important, security or user experience? Not always people are storing super secure data, uh, sometimes just a profile on some forum or not really important information. I may be relaxing those uh, rules is a, is a nice thing that you can win some extra users. And uh, as they prove with Dropbox, 20% uh, users would be login, 3% will never come back. Uh, the question is still open, like, is it really secure? Uh, authors of this paper, they, they prove in, uh, in some math uh, that knowing exact distribution, we know what will be the result. We don't know how good people are with predicting this distribution. We can only try with uh, as many databases as we got, uh, with as many words as we know, or as many passwords as we know, but we never know what will be the real distribution in this specific system, so we don't know what will be the normal chance of guessing those passwords. Uh, and, uh, and they would like to work on that more, and they would like to uh, investigate that uh, question more. And uh, that's it. <laughs> Questions? No, they, they, my impression of this paper was that they focus mostly of passwords that were generated by humans, like uh, most popular passwords, what people are actually typing. They were not really checking what will be the result if you use something else to generate those passwords. What about automated passwords, like SMS and things like that? 
Sure, it's it's of course uh, changing uh, the chance. Uh, the distribution probably will be, you know, uh, the chance that you will guess the passwords will be, of course, lower. Uh, the problem is, in the real world, uh, people are not using those passwords, like, in general. Uh, still, the most popular passwords is one, two, three, four, five, six, and uh, the top thousands of those most popular passwords are kind of the same, like, really, really easy to guess. And if you know that, you got sometimes like uh, 11 or 13 percent chance that you will guess the password with with 10 tries. Yes. So you talk a lot about distribution of this database. Um, how is that distribution different between databases that we've seen, and why is it uh, Users. So. Why the distribution was different across different databases? Because there were different users, there were different number of users, different from different uh, from different times. Maybe they were not really talking about that. Why the distribution was different? They just assumed that the distribution of every single user database is just different. Like there are different kind of people over there. They are thinking about different passwords. Like the the top thousand is pretty similar. It's pretty the same, uh, but. The rest of the passwords is random. Uh, I don't know that. Uh, oh no, it's way more. Uh, I don't remember right now what was his, what was uh, the distribution of password in LinkedIn, but I believe the in this. The recent leak, but the, the the one two three four five six was really really popular. It was some percentage of passwords in total. Yes, please. Sure. Uh, so. I was not speaking about that, but they also uh, consider that uh, checking too many possibilities uh, on fly, it may uh, require more time, and you can start making some uh, time attacks uh, by uh, understanding how long you for how long you need to wait for a response. So, uh, what kind of uh, logic is happening behind like is it like just a simple check and maybe you are hitting the top thousand list or maybe you are just checking i don't know additional 20000 passwords and it will just extend the the answer i didn't know that either <laughs> So, we are letting them go. Yes. Because you want to more people to log in, you want to keep them, I don't know, make more money on them. Probably, yeah. <laughs> yes, but then you are starting to uh, exposing passwords. It's like uh, the idea, or the the general idea is to uh, not really inform anyone that he made the typo, but allow them if the password is close enough. Thank you. Okay, do we have critical mass? I think we have critical mass. Ah? Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, 
All right, while everybody sits down, I would like to remind you that we have another one of these ones coming up next month, and Paul over there is going to be speaking, and that's going to be really nice. And we may or may not have uh, special guests. Yes, I'm not supposed to say anything about it, but you may want to come and check out that one. All right, so let's get started. So I will tell you a little bit more about our speaker right now. Her name is Kieran, and she loves making things, uh, whether tinkering with circuits, circuits, writing software system, or sewing dresses. She, yeah. She worked on Stripe's infrastructure team and has previously built things for the New York Times, LinkedIn, and MIT C-Sale. Kieran holds a black belt in karate and can kill you with her bare hands as well. So, so watch out for the questions. All right, they gave me a Britney mic, so I'm pretty excited about this. Um, cool, so I will be speaking about a mathematical theory of communication, and this is June. Um, I'm Kieran Batarum, and I work on the infrastructure team here at Stripe. I've already been introduced. Um, I love hearing about the history of technology, so let me know if you have any good stories after this. Um, also, since this is a fairly small audience and I speak quickly, if I'm going too fast, raise your hand and I'll try to slow down. Um, cool, so the agenda. I've split this into three main parts. We'll start by talking about a brief history of communication systems, talk over some of the main points that this paper puts out, and then discuss some of the impact that it produced. So, a brief history from the 1800s. The late 1800s and early 1900s were a period of discovering all sorts of physical limits, from thermodynamics to mathematics. Carnot showed that there's a fundamental limit to the amount of energy that can be extracted from a heat engine. Einstein's special relativity found an upper limit on velocity, while Kelvin found an absolute lower limit on temperature. Gödel's incompleteness theorem um, put limits on what is knowable. As scientists described the world around them in more formal terms, they found fundamental um, limits on the universe they were working with. So during this period, communications was a burgeoning technology. Scientists and tinkerers were finding new ways to encode speech and information in order to send them over distances. This was a field still in, still in its adolescence in the 1940s. We'd been using a number of different communication systems at this list, and um, there was some dabbling into cryptography and systems in World War II, but there was still no formal definitions of how information was produced or presented or compressed. So um, to delve into a specific example, in 1858, Britain and the US collaborated, collaborated to lay a transatlantic telegraph table, which was a huge step forward in communications. These cables were pretty difficult to lay. This is a modern picture, but it isn't all that different from how they were put together in 1858. And they exhibited serious electrical problems. Unlike modern cables, the technology of the time didn't have inline repeater amplifiers, so they used large voltages to attempt to overcome the electrical resistance of 3,000 miles of cable. Also, at this point, there weren't any formal layers of network transmission, the classic layer cake diagram you may have seen in networks um, textbooks. So the only variable engineers had at their disposal to make the signal better was the voltages. The <laughs> reception across this cable was terrible, and it took an average of two minutes and five seconds to transmit a single character. On September 3rd, 1858, the cable failed. In an attempt to increase the speed of transmission, um, the, the voltage on the line was boosted from 600 volts to two kilovolts. Um, for comparison, outlet voltage is 120 volts. Imagine taking an extension cord, laying it across a bathtub. Now increase the voltage on that by 16 times and make that a 3,000 mile long extension cord in a bathtub using rubber from the 1850s. It's not a surprise the cable failed. Um, so, two minutes and five seconds to transmit a single character is about a bit rate of 0.064 bits per second. When um, they laid the next cable a couple of years later, that could get up to 10 or 12 words per minute, which is 10 bits per second. Modern, um, submarine, un modern undersea cables transmit at about 10 billion bits per second. <coughs> gigabits per second? Um, sorry. <laughs> and not just words, modern cables transmit text, video, music, scientific data, and pretty much any sort of information you might want to send across a con uh, an ocean. So this paper laid the fundamental science that enabled us to get from the undersea cable of the 1850s to the modern communication system we have today. It was first published in 1948 in the Bell Lab System Journal and came out of a couple of other papers. It was later republished a year later as this book, this is the paper, 
the mathematical theory of communication. Um, so it's one of those rare papers that defined an entire field of study. The seeds of the paper first appeared in a Bell Labs classified memo about cryptography written by Shannon in 1945. This brought him in contact with a couple of other researchers who were working on defining information or making telegraph cables work better. Um, Shannon's major contribution was unifying these disparate threads of research in several different fields into a single defining paper. So it feels almost derivative or unsurprising to read now. I got to it a couple of months ago, and it really didn't seem like new news, which it's an old paper, but um, it's the kind of thing that's fundamental enough to information theory and communications as a whole that it's really fun to read. It achieved three main innovations. It unified communication into a single science. So until this paper, there was one medium for voice transmission, another for radio, and still others for television and data. They were all completely different fields with people working on them with different ideas about how to make that better. This paper showed that all communication was fundamentally the same and that you can represent any source with bits. Building on points made in other researchers' work, this paper took the once vague notion of information and showed that it could be defined and quantified, laying the groundwork to discuss compression and encoding systems. And lastly, and the thing I think is the most interesting, um, Shannon proposed that you could transmit information without error, even over noisy channels, as long as you're below a certain limit described in bits per second. So talking about how all communication is the same, he put forth this, di this diagram, which you'll see pretty much verbatim in any description of communication systems today. It decomposed a system into component parts that could be pulled apart and independently analyzed. You have an information source that produces a message, a transmitter that encodes that to go over a noisy channel, and all of that runs back in reverse. This looks pretty much the same today. You get data in, you get estimated data out. You compress the sequence of bits you might be getting. You take those bits and turn them into symbols that add some error correction and other redundancy back in. Then you turn that into, you modulate that to turn the sequence of symbols into some sort of analog wave run that over your noisy channel that just messes your entire data up, and then do the entire process back in reverse. We'll be returning to this diagram over the course of the talk since this is, this is what a communication system is. So information is measurable. In thinking about the information content of messages, let's talk briefly about telegraph, tele, telegraphy. Um, when you send things over a telegraph, messages transmitted consist of sequences of letters. These sequences aren't completely random, in general, they form sentences, and the sentences have the statistical um, nature of English. So this structure constrains the kind of data you can produce, which means that there's an avenue for compression. Whenever you have some sort of underlying probabilistic structure, you can make that smaller. So the more predictable a message is, the less information it's giving you. So in this paper, Shannon uses Markov models to attempt to approximate English in an attempt to quantify the amount of information that a telegraph message might have. You can start by describing all of the letters as being produced independently with all of the sequences equiprobable. You get gibberish. However, English letters occur in different frequencies. Morse code actually takes advantage of this frequency by encoding the letter E with a single dot and using longer sequences for Q, X, and Z. You can dig into the structure of English a little further. Here he represents text with the Markov chain, which is a model that describes the way a process moves from a state to another state. Here, this text is produced by modeling the text frequency between individual letters. So it gives you diagrams that are similar to English. He carries this process on with full words. Certain commercial Morse codes actually um, represented common words and phrases with four or five letter code groups, which is digging deeper into the, the more common a word is, the shorter you can use it for. At this point, um, he uses word diagrams as in English, and it's almost starting to resemble James Joyce. <laughs> An English writer that the character of this point is therefore another method is not quite English, but... So it appears that if you have a sufficiently complex stochastic process, you can produce sort of a um, satisfactory representation of a source. Someone tell me later if I'm wrong about this, but in all the research that I could find, this seems like the first usage of Markov models for generating text, which is really neat. You can kind of see the first inchoate threads of natural language processing also winding their way through this paper. So you may have seen Markov processes in action before if you use Twitter. I like to think of that series of approximations to English as the great-grandfather of Twitter ebooks accounts. 
So this is an example of one run by a friend. It puts together recruiter spam and Arrowhead trip reports. So I'm focused on finding smart entrepreneurial people with strong engineering fundamentals that have become small and reside in fruit bowls. <laughs> it's the kind of engineer we all want. Let me know if you have, if you have any friends who reside in fruit bowls. We're hiring. <laughs> I briefly became conscious enough to join our team in San Francisco. <laughs> And a favorite, as related to the telegraph signal before, I'd like to send a shock of electricity. <laughs> Two kilovolts! <laughs> so at this point, Shannon's made a convincing case for describing a few different kinds of information sources mathematically. And for measuring, um, sorry, I switched my slides around. I was jumping ahead. So now that we've discussed the underlying structure that a message like English text might contain, let's pick a simple example of a situation where I'm trying to convey with an underlying probabilistic structure. Let's say that I want to get dinner, and I'm trying to communicate this to a friend. I'm fairly predictable, though, and I know what I like. Most of the time, I just want Thai. But with a very small probability, I will have ice cream for dinner, because I'm an adult. <laughs> so the classic way to encode this information is to use two bits. You have four choices. You can pick a symbol for each choice. That makes sense. This is a fixed length encoding with enough sequences to describe the necessary information that I'm trying to convey, ice cream for dinner. Um, I can express my choices more succinctly, though, if I use shorter bit sequences for more probable choices um, and longer sequences for less probable choices. This is kind of similar to what we were talking about with Morse code earlier, where you use a dot to represent an E. So since pizza and ice cream happen for dinner much less frequently, I can use longer sequences to represent them without losing too much efficiency. So this is an um, example called a Huffman code. This is a specific variable length code that was proposed in a term paper for a grad class taught by one of, Sh one of Shannon's colleagues a few years after this paper was published. Um, random facts. Um, so when you're writing out a Huffman code, you build out a tree of, of the possibilities. And you start by using the most frequent choices at top and the, sh the less frequent ones at the bottom. So this would give you a, does this have a laser? No. Um, this would give you a encoding of a single bit for the most frequent choice and three for the less frequent ones. So if you do the math out for the frequency distribution, the average number of bits I use to describe my dinner choices is 1.67, as opposed to the two I was using with the fixed length encoding. Huffman coding is actually often used today in combination with other compression methods in things like deflate, which is PK zips algorithm, a few other zip formats, and media codecs like JPEG and MP3. Um, so we're getting at something a little more fundamental here when we talk about the number of bits we need to represent a choice. The information content of a message tells us the average amount of information that you need to de deliver to resolve uncertainty. If you send fewer bits than this 1.67 on average, I won't give you enough information to tell you what I want for dinner. If I'm sending you a single bit, it's unclear if I want any of the last three choices. So in this paper, Shannon arrives at this formula for the amount of information you can get from a probabilistic process. If you graph, uh, graph this out for a system with two choices, um, that's the graph you get. And you can see that the point where you have the, le the most information content or the most uncertain uncertainty in the system is when everything is equal probable. This might sound kind of weird at first. You get the most information when everything is equal probable. But if you think of it as a situation where you don't have any prior knowledge on what the signal might look like, any delivery of information will give you, uh, sorry, any delivery of a message will give you a lot of information. Um, in sports games with well-matched teams, the message about a win or a loss actually gives you something you weren't expecting. It provides you with information. Argentina beating the US in men's soccer wasn't really surprising information to anyone. Um, <laughs> If you've taken any thermodynamics, this formulation for information content might look familiar. In physical sciences, the entropy of a system is related to the number of possible states that a system can be in. It's thus a measure of the degree of randomness in the system. Since thermodynamic entropy is related both in definition and mathematical form to the measure described here, Shannon ended up naming his measure information entropy. Um, he got this advice from von Neumann, who had worked on defining entropy for quantum mechanics. He told him to call it entropy for two reasons. In the first place, as I just mentioned, it looks the same mathematically. It means a similar thing. In the second place, and more important, nobody really knows what entropy is. So in a debate, you will always have the advantage. <laughs>
good advice for naming things. Um, so from this probabilistic model, you can, def you can derive the exact amount of information content a message source contains. This is related to the minimum number of bits you need to express a message without losing uncertainty. Um, looking at this from another angle, modeling language as a Markov chain starts to expose the underlying probabilistic structure that produces speech. Some letters occur more frequently than others. The sequence TH appears more frequently than XP. And the existence of this structure allows you to compress the sequence by properly encoding the message into shorter symbols. So in this way, information content is very related to compression. Um, in the limit, oh, in the limit, the average code word length you need to express um, a message is less than or equal to the, sorry, I have that flipped, is, a pro is at least the average information per symbol. If you deliver less bits than the information content of that message, you're not going to provide people with enough information to resolve out what your original message was. This sets a limit on lossless encoding, um, lossless compression, which means that Pied Piper isn't really a thing. Um, <laughs> so in practice, actually, compression algorithms often encode a tiny bit of redundancy over the Shannon information limit back in, in the form of checksums or parity bits to ensure that you can detect and correct for errors. But we'll get back to that. So backing up to review, we've spoken about this section. We define the entropy of an information source and how to describe the source statistically. We've touched on compression limits and hinted that you don't always want to compress to the limit. Um, encoding that stream of compressed bits into symbols plays a really critical role in how much information you can stuff into a noisy channel, but we'll get back to that later. Let's talk about statistically modeling the channel, which brings us to the third point. You can transmit information without error as long as you're up to a very specific limit. Um, so let's talk about the simplest message you could be sending over a channel, either a zero or a one, and on that channel you could be receiving a zero or a one. So if I'm sending a zero, 90% of the time on this noisy channel, I get a zero back, and 10% of the time I get a bit flip, similarly with ones. This means that the probability that you're receiving a zero depends on the probability that you're sending one, and vice versa for ones. Um, since information entropy is just an expression of the probability of a message's content, this means that the entropy of the message you receive depends on the entropy of the message you send. Still with me? Great. Um, so you can talk about conditional entropy or mutual information in this sense. So the formula looks like that, which you can rewrite as this. Um, so talking about the left-hand side, h of x is the entropy of the source, h y of x is the uncertainty in the received signal if the message is known. So talking about in terms of me giving you all a message, um, the amount of useful information I can model that I'm stuffing over this noisy channel is the left-hand side of this equation. It's the information content of the message I'm, t um, I'm trying to provide minus the uncertainty that the noise is adding into this room. So the left-hand side is my model of the useful information you're receiving. The right-hand side of the equation describes your view of the message. It's the information content of the overall message you're receiving with the noise added in, minus the uncertainty you have about what you think I'm sending you. The total amount of useful information that you receive is the right-hand side of the equation here. So the channel capacity, the amount of useful information you're receiving, is thus the rate of this. And this is the maximum rate at which you can transmit useful information over a noisy channel. If you're transmitting at this rate, you have enough information to resolve any uncertainties in the message. And if you're transmitting over this, you don't have, there's still uncertainty what you might be receiving, so you start seeing errors. The novel thing about this equation is that it defines a definite capacity instead of defining a channel limit for a given bit error rate. Um, put another way, the classical way to think about information capacity is in terms of a certain probability of errors. To make the probability of errors approach zero, you have to stuff more redundancy in, but this tells you that you only need a finite number of bits to express your information, no matter how noisy the channel is. So, um, talking about that specifically, let's say you're sending a zero and you get the probability of error is a quarter over your channel. So you can fix that by adding a parity bit, and now the probability of error drops by another quarter. And you can keep doing that until your probability of error diminishes, but you're adding an unbounded number of bits here. 
So as, you're, as you want to drive your probability of error down to zero, um, you might think that your overhead of the number of bits you need to send increases to infinity. So it's intuitively, it's intuitively obvious that this, is, this might be a problem. But what Shannon showed is that you can decrease the error rate to zero using a finite number of overhead bits. And that finite number is this capacity. Um, he also showed that if you use less overhead than the capacity asks for, your error probability ends up fairly large. Um, I have too many transitions. So here's the Shannon capacity calculated out for a specific channel. This channel has band-limited white noise, and transmitted um, signals are limited to a certain average power, P. Um, this formulation is pretty close to a lot of real-world systems. So this C is a channel capacity in bits per second over a continuous analog channel. Um, so for a given degree of noise um, contamination, that's the maximum amount of digital data you can send. This is the bandwidth in a, an electrical engineering sense. It's how many different frequencies you can talk over. It's the range of electronic or optical or whatever your um, medium is frequencies that can be used to transmit a signal. This is related to the bandwidth you might be used to talking about in bits per second. Um, and this is the signal to noise ratio, which is the ratio of power transmitted to the ratio of, uh, to the background noise. And, in, and modern communication systems squeeze out performance from both of these variables. Um, so this is pretty novel. This is a capacity which depends only on the fundamental characteristics of your channel. It depends on bandwidth and your signal to noise ratio. It doesn't tell you anything about the information you're sending or how much compression you have. This gives you an ultimate limit on how much information you can put through a noisy channel. Still with me? Great. So, to returning to this diagram, slower. A finite number of bits. Um, as in, you don't understand how we derived it or what the significance yeah, is. Um, so, given that you have a system that operates um, with a certain probability, this is the amount of information that you want to transmit over a channel. And h of x of y represents the um, uncertainty that a noise power might be adding into the channel, um, which means that you have a certain number of bits that I'm trying to transmit, which, which is the h of x. And your noise has a certain, um, a certain information content that it, it'll be adding in that obscures your message. And if you pull those both, if you subtract both of them, you get a certain amount of bits that you can transmit without it being obscured by the noise. So I, think, I think the answer to whether you're confused about it is parity. Traditional parity is not the way to achieve that. Traditional parity is not the way to achieve that. Correct. This was a straw man. This is wrong. This is how you might be thinking about it. Cool. And this is how people classically thought about it. This was an example of why this paper was so crazy when it came out, because it described that this was not the way you should think about the universe. You can produce better, um, better error correcting codes by a bunch of different channel coding techniques that we'll get to. But yeah, great. Um, sorry, to be clear, this is not the way to, this is wrong. This is the way people are classically thinking about it. Um, doop, doop, doop. Great. So we, returning to this diagram again, we've talked about the major conclusions that this paper put forward. We talked about the information content of messages, some compression methods, and how you can define the ultimate limit of lossless compression. So we talked about modeling noisy channels and the capacity of that channel. So now we can get to channel coding. Um, this paper had a ton of impact in a bunch of disparate fields. In fact, information theory became a serious buzzword pretty quickly and was the hot new topic that would guarantee you government funding. There was an explosion of absurd papers for a bit. There was a satirical editorial in 1858 in one of these journals proposing a fictional represent representative paper title called Information Theory, Photosynthesis, and Religion. <laughs> but, um, so compression and information content are interesting, but the area of impact that I find neat and I'd like to focus on 
is the development of channel coding techniques that brought us through the, to the threshold of the Shannon limit in modern communication systems. Um, what induced the development of channel coding as a theory and the development of more complicated codes was Shannon's theorem. His paper told you that it could be done. You could hit this limit if only you were more clever. And that spurred people on to do it. It was throwing down the gauntlet to, a fu to future researchers. It was a realization that we weren't even close to channel capacity and still have strides to make in places that spurred people on. Um, the channel capacity theorem gives us a sharp upper limit on the rate of any reliable transmission scheme. However, it does not give you constructive coding mechanisms that will approach this limit. It tells you that it can be done, but not how to do it. And finding such schemes has been the main problem of coding theory and practice from the 40s up to about the 90s, and there's still research done in it now. And it'll be our main theme in this section on impact. So when I'm talking about channel coding here, I'm referring to error correcting codes. These are methods of encoding the data in a way that enables you to detect and correct for errors while not adding too much overhead to the data. So a classic example of this kind of code is a, is a hemming code, which this is an extended hemming code and adds four parity bits as overhead to four data bits. The parity bits are arrayed in a way that allows you to detect up to two bit errors and correct a single one. So for example, if I have 0, 1, 1, 1 as my four bits of data I'm trying to send, these are my parity bits. If I see a bit flip in the second data, I can look at my parity bits and realize and correct for that single error. So this is an example of a fairly simple coding mechanism. Um, and it's the one that's still used today in computer memory. This, is, this kind of coding is called a block code. You turn a block of k digits into a sequence of n digits. So here I'm taking a block of four data bits and turning it into eight, a sequence of eight digits. Um, so if you only use three of these bits, you can detect single errors, but not necessarily correct them. And in that way, you're using less bits of overhead to be able to correct and detect more and more bits. So the other kind of linear codes are called convolutional codes. They're a pretty powerful and widely used class of codes, which are used in a variety of systems, including Wi-Fi and modern satellite communications. Convolutional codes only send the parity bits down there. Um, you take a sliding window and you combine the bits in different ways in order to encode your message out. The size of the window in bits is called the code's constraint length. The longer that constraint length, the larger number of parity bits are influenced by the preceding bits. And in that way, you can use a fairly long sequence of bits to encode your message out. Um, a larger constraint length generally implies a greater resilience to bit errors. The trade-off here, though, is it'll take longer to decode um, codes of a longer constraint length. So you can't increase it arbitrarily and expect faster decoding. So in this, um, this is a slightly less naive scheme than the repetition of parity bits we were talking about earlier. And here you can use a larger window of bits to influence a, um, whatever message you're getting out. So you're reducing the overall overhead per bit as your constraint window gets larger. So this takes some serious hardware. Um, so the development of coding theory as a field was heavily constrained by hardware. The more complicated your codes get, the more complicated encoders and decoders you need. The technologists of the 50s were badly limited by equipment complexity and cost. This is the photo of the first transistor prototype, which was put together in 1947, also at Bell Labs. 1947 is barely a year before this paper was published. Um, the first sequential decoder of a convolutional code was built at Lincoln Labs in 1962 and took about two rooms worth of electronics. So it was far, far easier uh, at the point this paper was published to just increase the bandwidth or power in the existing communication systems than to put any effort or money into making better coding techniques. Um, this quote's apocryphically, this quote is supposedly attributed to Shannon's boss at Bell Labs. Just use more power, more bandwidth. And this is where the field was for a long time. Research progressed in the theory of error correcting codes, but there wasn't much practical interest in, in implementing these. It's always, it was almost always more expensive to put more hardware in. Until space. Space changed things since power is expensive. This gave us room to mess around with bandwidth and error correcting codes. Also, NASA's budget at this time was fairly generous, which motivated the production um, of more involved hardware. Meanwhile, advances in hardware technology also pushed the field forward. In 1958, someone at Texas Instruments came up with the integrated circuit which allowed you to produce much smaller pieces of hardware for your decoding. 
Um, in 1968-58, NASA engineers decided to test the same sequential decoder built at Lincoln Labs, but miniaturized significantly thanks to hardware advan advances. NASA added that sequential decoder that was built at Lincoln Labs to Pioneer 9 on an experimental basis, and this became the first spacecraft to test out error correcting codes in communication, though it wasn't used for anything critical. The Mariner missions were the first to use um, coding formally, though the first few in the series still transmitted data uncoded and raw. This is a picture of Mariner 2, launched in 1962, which did a flyby of Mars. The Mariner 6, launched in 1969, was the first to officially use error correcting codes to transmit data. Sorry, that previous one was 68. This was necessary because the signal to noise ratio talking to Mars isn't all that great. Mars is far away. Um, for context, the design and use of this craft put some constraints on the type of codes you could use. You're working with a system where the central computer had an onboard memory of 512 words. Words. The command system was programmed with fewer than 100 commands, and the transmitters on board were these little 20 watt things. For context, average cell phone transmitter power is about half a watt, and some of the more powered cell phones can get up to one to two watts. That's what regulation um, limits you at. So this has barely 10 times the power of, of what your cell phone can be regulated to. So here is an example of pictures taken by each mission. Um, Mariner 4 used no encoding, and it's kind of a, I'm sure it's blurry from the back anyway. Um, it's kind of a blurry image. Mariner 6 used Reed-Muller encoding, which is related to, it's a block code, so it's related to the extended Hamming code we were discussing before. Mars is 140 million miles away on a 20 watt transmitter. Um, future missions took spacecraft even farther away though, and error correcting codes became more important. NASA's Voyager mission took advantage of a once every 175 year alignment of the outer planets to do a grand tour of the solar system. Voyager had a chance to stop by Jupiter, Saturn, and Neptune, using each planet's gravity to catapult it to the next. This was a fairly long journey, during a period when coding theory was making huge strides. One of the striking things about Voyager in this story is that is a tale of its communications progress, since they were able to upgrade it in flight. So Voyager 1 has currently left the solar system. So let's think more about that transmitter. The 20 watt transmitter on the Voyager 1 has to cover tens of billions of kilometers. We're still talking to this thing. Coding theory and the hardware technology used to implement it was rapidly expanding so much so that it was changed in flight. It carried an experimental Reed-Solomon decoder expressly for the greater communication range of the Uranus and Neptune um, phase of the mission. The new encoding scheme reduced the overhead to about one bit in five from a 100% overhead with the code it was using before. Um, and it reduced the bit error rate in the output information from about five in a thousand to one in a million. It's a significant increase in the field. So this is an image of Jupiter's great red spot taken by Voyager 1. Jupiter is 601 million miles away. The rate was about 115 kilobits per second when it was near Jupiter. This is a performance rate of almost 10 million over the Mariner 4 in a mere decade. And almost that and a little bit more than that over the telegraph line under the ocean from 1858. The received power at the deep space network is when the Voyager was near Neptune is on the order of 10 to the negative 16 watts. This is about 20 billion times smaller than an ordinary digital watch consumes. Voyager 1 is now 12.2 billion miles away. Modern spacecraft, like the Mars Pathfinder and the Cassini missions, combine Reed-Solomon encoding with convolutional coding, and they perform within about a decibel of the Shannon capacity limit, which is pretty impressive. We've gone, we've gone far with our coding techniques. So as a review and a final return to this diagram, this paper put forth three major proposals that sparked off information theory and communications as a science. It unified communication into a single science, giving us this diagram. Until this paper, there were a bunch of different ways to talk about communication and different ways to discuss it. It took the once vague notion of information and showed that you could define and quantify and talk about systems probabilistically. And it proposed that you could transmit information without error even over noisy channels up to a certain limit described in bits per second. The noisy channel theorem sparked off coding as a field of research, which enabled us to produce really complicated error correcting codes that enable um, communication even without error over four billion miles. Um, 
So I'll leave you with this image of Pluto taken by New Horizons from about 93 million miles away. All right, questions over there. Hey, so um, maybe I'm just being dense, but when you're talking about your, uh, the channel capacity you did mm -hmm. in terms of entropy, but how do you take the, the, when we defined entropy, it was in terms of the probability distribution of a discrete probability distribution. Mm -hmm. How do you take the entropy of a like, continuous, continuous source? Yeah. Um, if you're bounded by noise, you have a certain amount of um, symbols you can distinguish between them. So the hand wavy answer I could give you is that, um, pretty much everything at some point ends up being a discrete source. There's actually a more involved mathematical explanation to it, which I'm happy to talk to you about later. It will require a whiteboard. But yeah. No, that's a, that's a really good question. What? Isn't that in the paper? It is in the paper. That's one of the sections. It is one of the sections. <laughs> hey, uh, that was awesome. Thank you. Uh, in the talk, you, you talked a little bit about like optimality. Mm -hmm. Like you said, like you only needed 1.67 bits for the dinner example. Mm -hmm. um, can you briefly describe like how, how you go about like proving that like the tree scheme is optimal and there's no better way to do it? Um, doop, 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 sorry, this is a billion slides away. Yeah, sorry, I was way back. <laughs> no, no. Um, so we have the specific probabilities of the of what this dinner looks like. Um, and we can find the information content of it because we have the probability in the logs of it. And that ends up being 1.67. And the average length you can calculate by multiplying the probabilities times the length of the code word. So tie is a single symbol and so on. And they end up being the same number. Okay, cool, yeah. thanks. When you talked about upgrading the spacecraft from uh, an overhead of 50% to one in five, mm -hmm. um, what's the current best we can do now? Um, we can get pretty much up to the Shannon limit with something called uh, this very low, it has low parity density codes, I think. LPDCs and turbo L codes will get you almost there. Parity codes, yes. Right. Yeah. Okay. I know the acronym, I don't have the. Yeah, I just noticed that. Yes. Hey. Um, so you mentioned that channel coding topped out mid 90s, is that right? Um, channel coding for channels with average white Gaussian noise added, okay. where you have a certain power limit is pretty close to what you can do with low density parity codes. Okay, so that paper came out in 1948. Mm -hmm. um, do you, would you hazard a guess as to how many people he kept really, really busy? <laughs> <laughs> um, so actually, every couple of years, there was um, an IEEE symposium where they declared that coding was dead, we've made it. <laughs> so we just hit another one, maybe there's another revolution coming. <laughs> there was one in the 60s. Coding is definitely dead. Hey, thank you for the awesome talk. Um, I have um, a question. So you said the, the compression depends on the length of the code word, right? The, yes. the, the limits. So what if I just make the code word really, really long? Um. The shortest you can get the code word is related to the information content of the message. No, I mean, like, suppose I'm, I'm really interested in, I don't know, video, and I decide, mm -hmm. well, code word should be a second of video. That's a lot, that might be a lot longer than the code word for a lot of data compression schemes. So if I do that, can I make everything a lot smaller? I'm not sure I quite follow you. Um, yeah, I don't understand either. Um, so <laughs> maybe this doesn't matter. Well, so it, 
Right, you, all, all the distributions here are probability distributions mm -hmm. over a space of code words, right? I see, so if you're so representing if I, a video in terms of another video. Well, I mean, if, if I just, um, so okay, I'm, I'm interested in, in doing a Huffman encoding. So I do a Huffman encoding where I say the length of a word is, um, let's say, 64 bytes, right? Mm -hmm. um, and somebody else says, I bet I can do better than you. And you say, you can't, because we got this theorem. And they say, aha, I have a trick. I'm going to use a kilobyte for my code word instead. And I'm oh, going to get a, a better, um, it turns out like on the scale of a kilobyte, I, I can memorize more useful information about this distribution. So the actual size I can make the overall messages might decrease as a result. Your code words are described in bits per second. And that bit per second is what's related here. So the average length of your code word can't be shorter than the um, information content of the thing, ah. of the source. Oh, sorry. If your convolutional oh, yeah. code gets longer and longer? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Or I if mean, your code book. Well, just in, in general, is is the theory tolerant to that, or can you keep getting better bounds by using longer and longer code words? Obviously, the constraints of certain application scenarios would prevent you from that. You'd get some sort of natural code word length. Because the length of the code word is the words, Your compression is defined in bits per second and not in terms of code words. As the length of your code word gets longer, the amount of time it takes for you to communicate which code word it is gets longer. Oh, I see. Yeah. You have an observation? And then I think you're... Okay. So my question was, uh, so what does this say about the relation between information and entropy? That's still an area of research. Um, there are some who say that, informa that information entropy has a physical meaning. So when you have logic gates that destroy bits of information, since you take two bits and produce one, you're producing entropy in the world, you're releasing heat in that way. There are people who dispute that too. I don't have skin in this game. <laughs> so this is a little bit of an orthogonal question, but back in the 80s when we were building networking protocols, um, at the higher levels of the stack, we were limited because of what software could mm -hmm. do efficiently, right? So we ended up typically using checksums or rotating checksums mm -hmm. because anything else was too expensive. Um, I haven't followed the hardware world in that sense, but on regular CPUs, are there better tools for getting more reliability um, through channels now? I'm know? not sure if this has been encoded into hardware but Wi-Fi chips definitely include better tools for devo right. decoding. Right, and, and we, had, we had the same thing, for example, in Ethernet chips where they do yeah. the cyclic redund redundancy checks that we couldn't yeah. afford to do in software. And I'm not sure if yeah. they've pulled okay. that into processors yet. It's something I've been curious about for yeah. a while and haven't actually bothered I mean, to um, look at. Modern it. software compression techniques also take advantage of like producing, there's like a thread of research that tries to produce Markov models of the text you're trying to compress and compress it smaller that way instead of just using naive things that you could use across English in general. Yeah, so you had a lot of examples from astronomy, and this mm -hmm. may also be an orthogonal question, but supposing that we're actually at the theoretical limit of information coding, what kind of other mitigations are there if we want to do things like intergalactic communication? Like, does the, do the power requirements actually go up as the square, or are there other mitigating factors we can probably bring in? Um, the power requirement, the channel capacity is related to the log of the signal-to-noise ratio at the point you're getting it. So it's gonna be worse than the square you get from that. But related to that, beam forming is a thing that most antennas do. So instead of transmitting things in a perfect sphere, they'll use phased arrays so that you transmit your maximum power in one direction. Wi-Fi, modern Wi-Fi routers actually do this, which is why they have multiple antennas. They use that in a sequence of really, really weird things, but. All right, I guess my question is like, do we know which bar we're going after? Southern Pacific? <laughs> Okay, do you know where like to Yeah, it's a uh, 19th and oh, Harris? No, I don't know. Treat? Treat? That way. Okay, so normally we go to a bar after this thing. So let's give it up for Kiran. That was great. <laughs>
So come next month. Thank you to Stripe for hosting us, and we'll see you at the bar. Bye.